Uh, so 1 Peter chapter 5, it'll be on page 1078 in the Pew Bible. Uh, verse 8. Be sober-minded and alert. Your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion, looking for anyone he can devour. Resist him, firm in the faith, knowing that the same kind of sufferings are being experienced by your fellow believers throughout the world. After you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, establish, strengthen, and support you. To him be dominion forever. Amen. Through Sylvanus, a faithful brother, as I consider him, I have written to you briefly in order to encourage you and to testify that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you greetings, as does Mark, my son. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Let us be to God. Uh, let me just pray before we get stuck into it. Uh, Heavenly Father, what we know not, teach us. Uh, what we have not, give us. And what we are not, make us. Fit for your service and to your glory. Amen. Uh, well, hopefully you've been able to be with us for either all or the majority of our time in 1 Peter. Um, but we've, we've come to the end. Uh, we've come to the last section of 1 Peter, to the closing remarks. Uh, my prayer has been that you have been encouraged and strengthened in the faith as we have seen the radical extent to which God has blessed us. From being chosen by him and set apart for his glory to have an inheritance that will never fade, spoil or perish. We have a living hope for the future. Our temporary sufferings for our faith are a reflection of our unity with Christ and that God will not waste our sufferings but use them to refine and purify us. And that's just a snapshot of chapter 1. Peter is drawing to a close his letter of encouragement to believers Exiles scattered throughout Asia Minor to believers, foreigners and strangers scattered throughout northwest New South Wales. Peter has insisted that because of our new identity bestowed on us by God, we are to proclaim his praises to a watching world. Now, this proclamation must be matched by our practice, otherwise it undercuts any credibility of our message. Peter is not naive in his thinking, but rather he knows that when disciples of Jesus speak his message, it will be met with hostility. That as a result of our proclamation and practice, there will be persecution and suffering. But with Jesus' words echoing on Peter's lips that uh, you will have suffering in this world, but take heart, Christ has overcome the world, Peter draws his hearers near and says, persevere, stand firm in the faith, in the true grace of God. Uh, so what final words can Peter give us uh, as we seek to live out our lives as ambassadors for Christ and to the glory of God? Words of encouragement to persevere. Uh, you'll see in your handouts and on the screen a bit of a outline. So three areas that we're going to be looking at. Perseverance in the face of the devil. Perseverance by the God of all grace. And perseverance in the community we have been given. Uh, let's turn now to see how Peter firstly wants his hearers chosen together with him to persevere. Uh, so point one, perseverance in the face of the devil. For the third time now, Peter is calling his hearers to be sober-minded and alert. Uh, chapter 1, verse 13, set your hope completely on the grace that is to come. 
chapter 4, verse 7, With the end of all things being near, be alert and sober-minded for prayer. In chapter 5, verse 8, Be sober-minded and alert. Watch out for the devil. Now, in each case, we are to prepare our minds for action. As we wait for our Saviour's return, and as the end draws near, there is a real risk to God's people. Now, the risk is not persecution, or nakedness, or famine, or sword, because nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ. So what is the risk? Or better, who is the risk? Now, verse 8, your adversary, the devil, the accuser of God's people, the one who stands in opposition to God, his kingdom growth, and his Christ. He's depicted as a roaring lion on the hunt, seeking any that he can devour. Uh, Now, if you've seen any National Geographic program on African wildlife, you'll have seen how, how lions hunt how they'll track down their prey, waiting for the moment when the the poor gazelle or the zebra thinks it's safe. It's that moment of complacency that the lion then pounces. For most of us here, I suspect the idea of the devil prowling around uh, is a very foreign thought. Uh, That the devil is looking for a way to devour you is not something that we, as rational Western thinkers, often think about. In other parts of the world, however, uh, it very much shapes how they think. C.S. Lewis gives these helpful words. He says, There are two equal and opposite errors in which our race can fall about the devil. One is to disbelieve in his existence. The other is to believe and to feel an an excessive and unhealthy interest in him. Uh, For the most part, I think we fall into the first category. Uh, We live our lives completely oblivious to his existence. It's therefore very difficult to resist something that we're not even aware of. Again, Peter doesn't want us to lose our heads and be hysterical, but he does want us to be vigilant and sober-minded and alert. Peter is speaking from a place of experience when it comes to being tempted. Now, we heard about it in the reading from Matthew. Peter was with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, Jesus had asked Peter to stay awake and later warns Peter not to enter into temptation after he's failed to stay awake. The devil's attacks aren't always obvious, as Peter had experienced. Some are. Some aren't. Uh, So here are just three tools that the devil might use and to be aware of. Uh, It's not an exhaustive list, but I think these are the three uh, big ones. Uh, The first and most obvious tool that the devil uses, as seen in 1 Peter, is hardship and discouragement. The obvious attack of God's people. Uh, Peter even outlines this in verse 9 that the same kind of sufferings Peter's hearers are experiencing at the hand of the devil are being experienced elsewhere, and that's nothing new. The risk is not the persecution, however, but remaining firm in the faith. To experience suffering and to retreat to safety and security at the cost of neglecting our role of Christ's ambassadors and proclaiming his goodness is the risk. Now, this leads to the devil's second tool, making the world seem so attractive as to make the unsurpassing goodness of God seem, well, less good. Oswald Chambers says, the root of all sin is the suspicion that God is not good. That's the same lie that Adam and Eve believed all those years ago. Did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? No, you will surely not die. Adam and Eve believed that God might be holding something back, that he didn't have their best interests at heart, and the devil played off that. 
Uh, if nothing else, Peter has been showing us how good God is. Uh, he has given us everything and some. He has chosen us, given us a new birth into a living hope, an inheritance that can never be removed. How has he given us these things? Uh, through Christ. Have a look with me in verse, or chapter 2, verse 20, 21. Now, Christ also suffered for you, leaving an example that you should follow in his footsteps. He did not commit sin, and no deceit was found on, in his mouth. When he was insulted, he did not insult return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, so that having died to sins, we might live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were like sheep going astray. God didn't even spare his own son, but gave him for us, so that we could return to the shepherd and overseers of our soul. God has given us so many things, and yet the devil will prompt us to think that God is holding something back. We may be at risk of retreating to safety and giving in to discouragement, uh, but I think here in the West, here in Narrabri, we are far more at risk of being attracted to the fleeting pleasures of this world and to lose sight of the eternal riches awaiting us. Uh, the third and last tool, apathy and indifference. Uh, if the devil can't beat us away from Christ or steal us away from Christ, maybe he can just make life easier and help us drift away. Uh, again, C.S. Lewis is very helpful. Uh, I've loved reading his stuff uh, the last week or so. Uh, in the Screwtape Letters, uh, a book that he wrote, he imagines conversations between a senior, uh, more experienced demon and his junior nephew that he's trying to bring up in the occupation. Uh, discussing the importance of separating a believer from God, he says, but do remember, the only thing that matters is the extent to which you separate man from the enemy. Now, that's God. It does not matter how small the sins are, provided that their cumulative effect is to edge the man away from the light and out into the nothing. Murder is no better than cards if it does the trick. Indeed, the safest road to hell is the gradual one. The gentle slope, soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, without signposts. In a similar but perhaps less macabre way, the author of the book of Hebrews encourages his readers not to drift away, but to watch out for one another, not neglecting to gather together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other, so that you won't become lazy, but will be imitators of those who have inherited the promise through faith and perseverance. Our risk here in Narrabri is most likely being strongly pulled away from Christ by the attractiveness of the culture around us, or simply by drifting away on the current of apathy until we look back and we cannot even see the shore. Know that the devil is real, and know that the, know what the devil is using to draw you away from Christ, and resist him. Stand firm in your faith. Don't dismiss the devil as a toothless lion, only roaring, uh, but don't, not, don't be overwhelmed by fright that he'll tear you to shreds. Uh, Peter has already mentioned that we are being guarded by God's power in chapter 1. And so don't fear the devil or be intimidated by him, but rather in your hearts regard Christ as Lord. God's promises give us great assurance to persevere in the face of the devil. So resist him, firm in your faith. And these promises are where Peter takes us next. If we are to persevere in the face of the devil, we can only persevere by the God of all grace. And so point two on your outline, perseverance by the God of all grace. Verses 10 and 11. 
Peter is ending his letter the same way he started, pointing his hearers back to the bedrock of their faith. Now, those whom God has chosen, living as exiles, dispersed abroad, are those who God has called. Our place in God's family is firmly rooted in the fact that we are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God and loved by God before creation. God's initiative in a believer's salvation should give us immense encouragement. God will not start something he cannot finish, and the finish is wonderful. Uh, This calling that we have is not to some mediocre or average existence, but to God's eternal glory. God has not only redeemed us from an empty way of life, Peter reminds us that the purpose, goal and reward of our faith is to stand before God and enjoy Him. Now, verse 10, Peter quickly gives us four verbs to describe the action God will take to prepare His own for His eternal glory. God Himself will restore, support, strengthen and establish you. It's a reminder for believers that at the end of all things, God will eventually restore whatever they have lost for the sake of Christ. Peter could have well used one word to describe God's actions to make his people whole, Uh, but I think using four words uh, similar yet different uh, amplifies the rhetoric um, to highlight God's active, that God is actively bringing about his people's restoration. And so, as verse 10 also says, uh, although we will suffer, or suffering will come first, it will be followed by eternal glory. Uh, The God who effectively called believers by his grace will fortify them by his strength so that they will be able to endure to the end. Uh, Now, over the series, we've been uh, pounding the P alliteration, So I just want to add another one. Proclamation, practice, persecution and perseverance, Peter now shapes our perspective. And now it's hard sometimes for our finite brains to understand and get our heads around the concept of the temporary and eternal. But for Peter, it's front and centre. While the end times... So the period before, uh, between Christ's ascension and his second coming may seem long, and yes, it's been 2,000 years already. God sees this as noticeably briefer. Although our sufferings may seem long and intense, 50, 60, maybe 70 years, it will be a flash in the pan when compared to the final joy we will experience with God in eternity. Now, for Peter, the sufferings and persecutions we experience for this short time will pale in insignificance when compared to God's eternal glory. And this has been the case throughout God's Word. I don't know if you heard it in Psalm 27. A little while, and the wicked person will be no more. While they seem to prosper, their prosperity will end. Peter wants us to hold tight to this, that while persecution seems long, it is really just for a short amount of time. He wants us to stand firm in our faith, knowing that the best is yet to come and knowing who has our eternities in his hand. There is no one else compared to our God who has dominion and rule over all. God's people rest easy knowing that sovereignty and rule belong to God alone. In verse 11. While we wait, we can persevere knowing that our glorious future is secure, that God himself will restore us. But did you notice the means through which this will occur? That's a very small detail, but it makes a world of difference. Uh, Verse 10, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory 
in Christ. That's what separates Christians from every other world religion. If we merely speak of God saving us, then which God are we referring to? As Christ's followers, we are distinguished from the world on the basis that we rely not on our own works or achievements, but on what Christ has done for us through no merit of our own. Throughout his letter, Peter consistently reminds us that the basis of our faith, the living hope that we have, comes through the death and resurrection of Jesus. Jesus is our template. It is through Jesus we believe. As we come to Jesus, the living stone, we too become living stones of God's temple. As Jesus suffered, we too will suffer. Just as Christ was glorified, we too will be glorified. From beginning to end, Peter makes it very clear that our perseverance comes by the grace, by the God of all grace, as we live out our faith in Christ. Well, we've seen that in order to finish well, we need perseverance in the face of the devil. Perseverance by the God of all grace as shown in Christ. And lastly, perseverance with the community that we've been given. Now, point three, perseverance in the community that we've been given. Peter is aware of the struggles that believers face. Now, he's aware of the struggles that you and I will face. They are called, we are called to be different in a culture that seeks to sway us away from God and away from Christ. There will be pressure to conform to the attitudes and behaviours of those around us, to seek first our own kingdom instead of God, to insist on our own authority rather than being submissive, coming under the authority of God and those that he has placed in authority, to seek pleasure and comfort rather than proclaiming Christ and so be subject to suffering as Christ suffered before us. And when these pressures and temptations arise, and they will, and already have, how will God's people stand firm? Well, by the very nature of his letter, Peter helps us to see. Now, here is one part of the body of Christ supporting another body of Christ. In verse 12, Peter says that he has written to encourage fellow exiles to stand firm. Uh, and he even does this in community with Sylvanus and Mark. Uh, likewise, we can be encouraging each other here in Narrabri, within our diocese and our brothers and sisters throughout the world, through whatever means uh, does it for you whether that's old school letters, the thing that you have to put a stamp on, I haven't sent one of those in a while, emails, texts, phone calls. And this encouragement is not just, how are you going? What have you been up to? It's not just asking how the crops are going, but how someone's Bible reading is going. It's not just taking an interest in someone's parenting habits, but more importantly, their prayer habits. It's not just being keen to gather together for the game, but rather, more eternally significant, gathering together to spend time worshipping Jesus. Encouraging one another in the faith and building each other up. Uh, one of the things that has struck me as we've worked through 1 Peter is how Peter's letter is saturated with Old Testament language. He knows what the true grace of God is because he lives and breathes God's word. His worldview, or the way he thinks about the world, is framed by the message of the cross. Peter knows the promises of God, and so he is able to rely upon them. When the devil comes prowling, accusing God's people... Knowing God's word and the hope and promises that lie within is one of the best defences against them. That's why I think it was so encouraging to see the kids up front 
What is your identity? You are a holy nation, a royal priesthood, a people belonging to God. Now, there's a bond between believers that transcends geography and even time. Peter likewise stands chosen with those chosen exiles throughout Asia Minor and those chosen exiles scattered throughout the whole world. God's people are to stand firm, but they do not stand firm alone and they do not stand firm without power. They, we, Stand in the true grace of God. Now, the true grace of God is the promised exaltation that comes through present sufferings. It's the guarantee of a future inheritance for those who have been born again by Christ's grace and are carried along by his kindness. And this has been Peter's message all along. In the face of unjust suffering and living as temporary Visa holders, longing for our future home, Peter calls us to stand firm. Stand firm in the true grace of God as we suffer simply because we bear the name of Christ. Stand firm knowing that while the world may take everything away from us, it cannot take our glorious identity or our imperishing future, our imperishable future, because we are elect exiles set apart by the Holy Spirit for the salvation accomplished by Christ and are now on our way home. We stand firm knowing that even though the world may kill us, we have been born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ to an imperishable inheritance. We stand firm knowing that God does not waste our sufferings. He intends for it to purify our faith in order that we may obtain the future salvation when Christ is revealed. We stand firm knowing that that our Lord Jesus Christ travelled the road marked with righteous suffering and blazed the path for us to follow. We stand firm knowing that if we suffer for doing good, we will be blessed and be exalted to glory as Christ was. We stand firm knowing that as we share in Christ's sufferings, we are proven to be Christians. We stand firm knowing that he will exalt us as we humble ourselves under God's mighty hand and those he has placed in authority. We, are, we stand firm knowing that the devil is subject to Christ's power and authority. We stand firm knowing that the God of all grace will himself restore, support, strengthen and establish us after we have suffered a little while. We stand firm knowing that we stand with other believers throughout the world facing similar or worse persecutions than our own. We stand firm for the love of of Christ and to the glory of God. Let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, you have uh, blessed us abundantly. I pray that we will uh, never forget how much you have uh, done for us, uh, the cost that it was to you to bring us to yourself. Thank you that Christ willingly suffered and died for us. Thank you that you rose him in power and authority and that he sits at your right hand. Thank you that we can stand firm on your promises. Thank you that we can trust in you, knowing that at the end of all things, you will bring us to yourself. Thank you that our sufferings are only for a short time, but our eternal home with you will stretch on forever. We pray, Heavenly Father, that we would uh, see Christ and live out his example for us. And I pray that we would not be distracted by the attractiveness of the world around us or fall into the temptation of apathy and so slowly drift away. 
Uh, Heavenly Father, I pray that you would uh, ignite in us a desire to know you through your word, to know the promises that you have told us, and to stand firm on them. Amen.